wasn't born into the Seventh-day Adventist Church. But at only 14 days old, I was taken from the hospital and placed in the hands of someone who was a member of this church. See, my biological parents of Italian and Dutch descent did not want me. I wasn't in their plans. They had their own problems. And then I was placed into foster care. I experienced rejection from the day I was born. Very early in life, living with different people who believe that the Seventh-day Adventist Church is the remnant church, I learned a few things that took deep roots into my tender soul. I believe that I was lucky enough to be alive. God gave me a second chance and he wanted to save me. But I had to be really good or be gone. Growing up, I had a sense of not being good enough. Because of if even my own biological parents did not want me, who would? Not God, not anybody. I would not have the right to belong to anyone. And for sure, I didn't have the right to be anywhere. Or maybe I could buy my way into belonging to someone, belonging somewhere. Thus, a legalistic nature was imprinted in me. As a child, I never worried about a monster under the bed for two reasons. One, I never had a bed of my own when I was a child. And second, because the real monsters appeared in real life when I was repeatedly threatened by those supposed to be taking care of me more time than I can count. They would told me that if I didn't behave, I would be thrown into the streets. That threat terrified me more than any night terrors a child could endure because abandonment was real. By the time I turned 11 years old, I thought I knew who God was. I had learned about him through the teachings in the children's Sabbath school. And I knew that I was not good enough for him. And I would never be allowed to belong to his kingdom. I also knew about Jesus. I learned that he was the son of God, but he was not God himself. I learned that he was just like me. If I could sin, so could he. Jesus started to make a difference in my life though is he became a secret friend to me. I even told him once in my childhood prayers that I felt sorry for him because I knew that he had a tyrannical father, God. In fact, I used to ask my new best friend, Jesus, to protect me from God. Once, I even had the courage to pray to God and ask him to please burn me quickly when Jesus returned. Because I was 100% sure that I did not belong to heaven. I could not bear the weight of following all the laws. I knew that at some point I was going to fail. As I grew up, I felt like I was raising myself. I was at the mercy of those who would have me in their homes for a while not because they cared about me, but because having me in their homes gave them the excuse to extort money from the charity of the local church. Others used my presence as a source of self-satisfaction. When they would stand up during the personal ministries report, remember, every Sabbath school, and they would declare how many people they had helped that week. And I was one of them. And how many good deeds they had done to me. Caring for me gave them many goodness credits. I also encountered a few of 
the so-called godly men, leaders at the local church, who took advantage of the fact that I didn't belong to anyone and sexually harassed me. But I must also say that I encountered some few good-hearted people who showed honest love towards me. By the time I was in high school, I had a head full of questions that no one could answer, not with a biblically satisfying argument. I loved reading the Bible, but honestly, I thought that I was a little dumb because the things I learned in Sabbath school and church would not add up with what I, I read in scripture. And I didn't even know what questions to ask sometimes. But I knew that I had to trust my Adventist believers and pastors. Never read a book or a magazine that was published by someone other than our holy Adventist press, was what they told me. So I grew dumber. I had never in my life read a book or a magazine that had not been written for, by someone that belonged to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. When I got my first job right after high school, I started to save money to buy my very own first. Did you think I was going to save my first car? No, not me. I saved enough money to buy my very own private collection of the inspired pen, the spirit of prophecy, the books inspired by the writings of Sister White. I read her books and became my own version of Super Holy Little Debbie. Now I was being praised for my character, for my rising above circumstances, and for being able to quote the holy text extracted from Sister White's writings. I even dressed like her sometimes. I'm not kidding. I have pictures to show you. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> Scary, cute though. But I also had questions about her writings and knew that those questions would have to be answered one day in heaven if I ever made it up there. I don't know if you remember, but I used to make plans and appointments. Oh, I'll see you under the tree of life on the third Sabbath in heaven. And I would say, no, that date is reserved for me to meet Ellen White because I had many questions. Eventually, I did have enough money to buy my own car. But something very interesting happened. I wasn't going to buy insurance because I knew that God was the only insurance I needed. Ellen White said so. The gentleman who sold me the car refused to let me take that beautiful new car from the lot without insurance. He was a member of the church and he said he was protecting me. But sir, Ellen White doesn't agree with insurance buying, I said. What he said next shook me to the core and changed the way I thought about the spirit of prophecy. You don't have to follow everything that Ellen White says because she wasn't right about many things. What? I bought insurance and drove my new car away. I never asked questions about that shocking comment and I kept my doubts to myself. I had a credential. Um, I worked for four years as an assistant to four departments in the Northeast Union Conference of Recife, Brazil. Not long after that, I moved to Connecticut and attended a local church. I immediately became a committee member. And before long, I found out that at that particular church, they had a policy which they renewed every year concerning their use of Ellen White. 
the policy stated that no one was directly to call her a prophet. Her writings could be cited from the pulpit, but never linked to her divine inspiration. That puzzled me. 9-11 came. And as a new resident of this country, I wanted to hold prayer meetings and vigils for America. But I was stopped in my tracks by a pastor who quoted in her, Ellen White, told me that praying for America would be a waste of time because Sister White wrote about the doom that awaits this country. That day, I made an inner decision never to read any books by Ellen White again and publicly rejected her as a prophet. I left the Seventh-day Adventist Church right after I moved to Texas in the summer of 2006. Knowing that I am Jewish and believing that I had to keep the Sabbath, I looked for a Messianic synagogue in Dallas. There, I could put all the pieces of the law together and keep not only the Sabbath, but all the commandments and the statutes of the Old Covenant. I even took the Nazarite vow. And for a while, I never cut my hair, never touched the fruit of the vine, and never stood close to a dead person. I was much better as an observant Jew than I was as a holier-than-thou Seventh-day Adventist. Maybe now I could be allowed into heaven, I thought. Eleven years went by, and one day someone invited me to go to a Christian church with her. To be polite, I went. The pastor was just starting a series of studies on the book of Galatians. And that day he started his sermon with a question. Who is your mother? That caught my attention right away because I never had a mother. I wanted to see what he had to say about that. He was talking about the typology of Hagar and Sarah the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. Hagar was a slave and gave birth to a son born of the flesh, while Sarah was the free wife and gave birth to a son born of the promise. Hagar represents Mount Sinai and the Old Covenant that proceeded from there. The law written on stone tablets brought a curse, and Hagar and her law-keeping children are slaves to sin and death. Sarah, though, represents the heavenly Jerusalem, the new covenant, and she had her new covenant children, and they're all free. They are not under the law, but are alive in Christ, and so am I, because he became a curse on the cross so I can have his law written in my heart. And I have eternal life, just like Sarah and her son of the promise. Listening to the pastor, I understood once and for all, finally, what the Apostle Paul said in Galatians 3, 7, 28, 29. I want to find out just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by deeds based on the law or by hearing based on faith? There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. For you are all one in Jesus Christ. And if you belong to Jesus Christ, then you are Abraham's seed. Heirs according to the promise. That day, I went home and read the whole book of Galatians. Understanding who my mother was, that she was Sarah, a free woman, set me free to understand 
who Jesus really is. John 17, 5. That's what Jesus said. Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world came to be. Now, I also understood Paul's words in Romans 9, 11. To them belong the patriarchs, and from them, according to the flesh, Christ, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. Jesus is God. And because of that understanding, I will never be the same. I am free and redeemed. I am sealed by the Holy Spirit, born of water and of the Spirit. And yes, I do belong to the kingdom of God. Through the blood that was shed on the cross by Jesus, the perfect lamb that takes away the sin of the world. Jesus is the glory of God. Jesus is God himself. 